But today we're here to talk about uh, the ongoing research that the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum has been involved with uh, around the Revolutionary War uh, on Lake Champlain. We have two main topics of discussion today, the first being uh, the gunboat Spitfire, uh, and the second being the work that we've been completing at Arnold's Bay on the Vermont side of the lake down near the Maritime Museum. But let's start off with just a little bit of, you know, why was the revolution fought here on Lake Champlain? Or why was it such a big component of the early years of the war? Uh, and it really boils down to just controlling the water route through the wilderness, right? In the second half of the 18th century, this was still a, a relatively trackless uh, wilderness uh, in comparison. So the only way to easily move large amounts of men and material through this area was on water. So controlling the waterways was absolutely essential uh, for trade and for uh, military uh, endeavors. So controlling Lake Champlain uh, is a big part of this corridor, right? If you include the Richelieu River, which is where Lake Champlain empties out into the St. Lawrence, uh, and Lake George and the headwaters of the Hudson River, you have a nearly continuous water route from the St. Lawrence down to New York City. Controlling that was incredibly important. And it was already an avenue of invasion in both directions uh, during multiple previous colonial wars, and it would prove to be so during the Revolution. Um, in 1775, American forces uh, invaded Canada using this water corridor as one of the one of their avenues of attack, anyway. Um, and they invaded Canada. Uh, unfortunately, were uh, were stopped at Quebec City and were forced to retreat during the winter of 1775 into 1776. Whoops! Oh, I did something. Yeah, you just hide that. Oh, technology, there we go. Um, as they retreated uh, up the St. Lawrence, they then, then retreated up Lake Champlain and established themselves at Fort Ticonderoga and set up a shipbuilding effort at Skeensboro, New York, which is now modern day uh, Whitehall, New York. Um, with a strengthening defenses at Fort Ticonderoga, uh, they were hoping that they could potentially stop uh, the expected British invasion from the north, uh, but they knew that they needed a fleet of vessels to deny the use of this water corridor uh, to the invading British. Um, so they set up uh, in Whitehall or in Skeensboro and began building vessels frantically. Um, it, Skeensboro was known as Skeensboro because it was the property of Philip Skeen. Um, who had established uh, a number of sawmills and ironworks in, in, on his tract of land there at the southern end of Lake Champlain. Um, Skeen was actually a loyalist uh, to the British crown, so the colonial forces had no, uh, you know, no problems taking over his estate and putting his equipment to work building vessels for the rebel fleet. And of course, those were all the infrastructure that you needed to start building this fleet was right there in Skeensboro, which is why they chose to do it at this location. Um, the core of the American fleet was centered around a number of small sailing vessels like the one we have here in the center that were captured during the 1775 campaign. The one in the center there is the Royal Savage, a small schooner that was captured at Fort uh, St. John when it was captured in 1775. Um, but that was just a small number of vessels, and Benedict Arnold and his, his commanders realized they needed to build a more substantial fleet. So they started building two main different types of vessels. The first being the gunboats, which are on the far left, um, sometimes referred to as gondolas. This is a 54-foot long vessel, 15 feet wide, carries three guns. Uh, this has a single mast with square sails on it. Honestly, not a super effective fighting, fighting platform, right? Those three guns are all pointed in different directions. Uh, the sailing rig, well, it was effective if you had good wind from the stern. Was not very effective in any other <laughs> weather conditions, particularly because this, bottom, this boat is flat bottomed. So they would just go to the side if uh, it had no lateral resistance. So they were pretty much rowed everywhere um, when they weren't able to go directly with the wind. Uh, and in total, they built eight of these gunboats. Um, but they came to realize that maybe they were going to need some more substantial vessels. And they started building the row galleys, which you see here on the right with the triangular sails. And they all, by the time the Battle of Valcourt Bay took place, they had launched three of these larger 
row galleys um, for the fleet as well. These boats are a little over 70 feet long, about 20 feet wide, <coughs> carried 10 to 12 guns, depending on what they had at the time to put on them. They're rigged with Latin sails, which are those big triangular sails. They're fore and aft, which means they're a little better sailors than the square rigged uh, gunboats, at least in the narrow confines of Lake Champlain. You had a little better sailing characteristics with those um, large Latin sails. But they were also, as the name would suggest, equipped to be rowed as well. You can see these, these little ports between the gun ports are actually where they could deploy sweeps or long oars out through the side of the vessel and propel those boats with oars if they needed to as well. By late summer, early fall, they had assembled a fleet of 15 vessels. We had three, we had the eight gunboats, the three row galleys, which are the, uh, the Washington, the Congress, and the Trumbull, and then the couple of smaller vessels uh, like the Royal Savage that are still in the fleet. Um, at the same time that the American fleet was being constructed in Skeensboro, the British were doing the same at the northern end of the lake at St. Jean, <laughs> um, where they built uh, a large number of gunboats as well. So they, they opted for a smaller uh, design you see here on the bottom. Most of their gunboats were in the 35 foot range, just carried a single gun that was in the bow of the vessel, um, you know, which actually probably makes more sense. Just point the point the boat at the uh, at the enemy, and you fire your gun. No, no, no need to swivel the boat around to try to bring those side guns uh, to bear. But they also built a lot of larger vessels, uh, including the Inflexible, which was the largest sailing ship that had operated on Lake Champlain at the time. And this is a full fledged warship, uh, you know, compared to everything else that's on Lake Champlain. They had a number of boats that they were, had been using on the Saint Lawrence. <coughs> that they stripped all the upper works off of and were able to fight up through the rapids of the Richelieu and bring to St. John and then reconstruct them. Uh, some of the gunboats were actually sent over from England uh, kind of as a kit boat, you know, where they had been built and then disassembled and all the pieces numbered and they were able to put them back together pretty quickly. Um, the British fleet also had the advantage of having actual Royal Navy sailors from the St. Lawrence fleet and from the East Coast that they could bring on to Lake Champlain to man these, uh, these vessels. So in the end, the, the British uh, you know, created a much more powerful fleet than the colonial fleet at the time, and it was much better manned. But uh, you know, we'll see how things work out here. <laughs> um, the two fleets finally met in combat at the Battle of Valcourt Bay on October 11th, 1776. I'm sure most of the folks here know where Valcourt Island is. Uh, the American fleet, or Benedict Arnold, positioned the American fleet between Valcourt Island and the New York shore in what is honestly a very clever position. Um, he knew that the British were going to be having to come from St. John uh, on a northerly wind, right? That's the only thing that was going to carry them up the lake. And by the time they realized that the American fleet was there behind Valcourt, or at least the, the only way they could really come to grips with them was to come past the island and then try to sail up into the wind to come to grips with the American fleet that was hidden there. Um, there are some reports that some of the pilots on the British uh, fleet were aware that there were some shoals at the northern end of Valcourt Island, and they couldn't just duck in that way and attack the American fleet from the from the rear. Um, this clever, you know, having having the British fleet have to fight up into the wind really meant that a lot of the larger vessels, the Inflexible, uh, the Thunderer, which was this giant rado floating gun battery thing, it's a very strange vessel. They actually couldn't sail up into the wind, and they ended up being stuck way down here. Um, and, and didn't take a huge part in the battle because they just couldn't get up close enough to the American fleet. So the majority of the fighting on the British side was carried out by their gunboats, which you can see in this long line here, and a couple of their better sailing schooners like the Carlton uh, played a pretty active role. Fighting commenced uh, bef before noon uh, on the 11th and lasted until, until darkness fell that night. Um, the American fleet definitely took the, uh, the, the worst of, of the fighting, um, with at least 50 men killed, um, and they found themselves as darkness fell 
short on ammunition and gunpowder and really kind of in a pickle. Um, the British backed off, uh, well, as, as darkness fell, we also have the, the first sinking of an American vessel, the, the gunboat Philadelphia, which had been struck by a 24 pound cannonball right in the starboard bow, um, was not able to stay afloat. And here we see the crew of the Philadelphia escaping onto the Rogal Washington. And that boat sank uh, at its position there at Longport Bay. <laughs> what have you noticed? The, the Washington, which is the boat in the background here, is one of those row galleys that we talked about. Uh, it no longer has two large triangular sails. It has just one. Uh, and I believe this is probably supposed to be the, the foremast of the <laughs> Washington floating here, which had just been shot away during the course of the battle. And that's actually going to that's going to factor into our story as we move forward here. Uh, the British, uh, as, as darkness fell, the British settled back a little ways and set up what they thought was a pretty good blockade from the southern end of Valcour Bay, uh, Valcour Island, over to the New York shore. Um, and, you know, on this map, it looks like, oh, they, they probably had the, the boats were lined up and it was probably like a solid wall of timber. You know, that distance is, is well more than a mile and there's no way that they, you know, the, the British fleet wasn't that big. So there were certainly gaps in that line and um, the Americans were able to sneak through that line and escape in the middle of the night. By hanging a lantern in the, in the stern of each vessel that was shrouded on three sides so it could only be seen from directly astern, the boats all got themselves into a single file line and with muffled oars, they snuck through the British line along the New York shore uh, as close as they could get without running aground and they managed to escape south without the British noticing them. Now, they were probably greatly aided in this effort by the burning of the Royal Savage. Um, I don't have a pointer, but you can see on the very southern tip of Valpar Island in that map, uh, the Royal Savage had run aground um, on the southern tip of the island very early in the battle, and the vessel was burned to make sure that it wasn't captured and used the following day. I'm sure that proved a, a, a great distraction for uh, the poor century, centuries on the, uh, on the British vessels, you know, in the darkness after a long day of fighting, to have this extremely bright uh, fire going on at the southern end of the island, I'm sure was a great distraction. The other thing that we have to keep in mind is that I'm sure that all of these guys were functionally deaf at this time from the concussion of these cannons firing all day long. So it might seem... You know, nearly impossible for this American fleet to escape, but I think they had a, a couple of factors working for them in addition to their clever plan of using the shielded lanterns to help them escape. Uh, the Americans uh, fleet fled south. Uh, during the night, they stopped near Schuyler Island where they had to abandon two more of the gunboats. This is where the gunboat Spitfire was abandoned uh, and sunk into deep water. The gunboat Jersey was also abandoned and they attempted to sink it. Uh, unfortunately, it was picked up by the British fleet the following morning or the following day uh, and they found it swamped. You know, it was, it was full of water, but it was still floating at the surface and they were able to recover that vessel and actually incorporate it into their fleet for future usage. Um, during the day of October 12th, the two fleets, uh, you know, the, obviously the British, when they, when they awoke in um, the morning of the 12th and saw that their quarry had escaped, they quickly looked south and saw the masthead still uh, on the horizon and set off in pursuit. Um, at this point, the reports are that there was still mostly a southerly wind. Um, so both fleets were kind of fighting their way into the wind as they headed south. Um, the two fleets were several miles apart. You know, there was no fighting that happened on the 12th, uh, but they just both kind of worked their way up the lake during the day of the 12th. Um, on the morning of the 13th, uh, the wind shifted to out of the north. And as the British fleet was north of the American fleet, they caught that wind first. And so that brought them down onto the American fleet rather quickly. Um, and the Americans were still mostly just rowing and not having any of that wind to support them until the British arrived uh, alongside them. Um, and from that point, which was near Split Rock, Split Rock Mountain, uh, one of the narrowest points of the lake, we have about a two hour running gun battle from there 
to Ferris's Bay, which is now known as Arnold's Bay. Now, this run and gun battle really started with the capture of the Rogue Galley Washington. Uh, as we saw before, one of its masts had been shot away. It was apparently very badly damaged during the course of the fighting on October 11th. And uh, the commander of that vessel was actually afraid to even return fire to the British because he was afraid that just the firing of his guns would cause his boat to fall apart. <laughs> so he was forced to strike his colors and surrender that vessel. And while that was a significant loss to the American fleet, it has benefits for us in the future that we'll get to here in a minute. <laughs> um, the, the, so at this point, Benedict Arnold found himself with just a single rogue alley left, the Congress, and four of the, the gondolas. The other, um, the other uh, rogue alley, the Trumbull, uh, it actually made pretty good time. It had pulled pretty far ahead of the rest of the fleet, as well as some of the other small, uh, better sailing schooners uh, had stretched out from the little core of the fleet that Arnold still had with him, uh, as well as the one gunboat in New York, which uh, managed to make its way. But Arnold uh, in the Congress and these other four gunboats were surrounded by the British fleet. And this is where the, the, the better sailors and the larger vessels really came to tell. As the British vessels were able to pull up alongside the American vessels and just you know dump whole whole broadsides into those escaping vessels, or sail across the stern and rake those vessels with shot, um, and it really quickly became apparent that Arnold was going to lose the entire fleet if he didn't do something rather significant pretty quick. And so he decided to drive the, those five remaining vessels into Ferris's Bay run them up onto shore and set them alight um, and escape overland down to Fort Ticonderoga, to Crown Point and Fort Ticonderoga. He burned his vessels in an effort to you know, keep them from being captured and incorporated into the British fleet. And I'm sure it was a difficult decision, but it was probably the right one at the time. Once again, uh, Ferris's Bay was a really interesting choice. Um, it's a very shallow bay. We'll talk about it in more detail towards the end of this presentation, but uh, the larger British vessels were unable to sail in or unwilling to sail into the shallow harbor um, in pursuit of the American fleet. So they stood off or anchored just outside of the harbor and were firing at the escaping American troops and the vessels. <coughs> Uh, and here we see an image from the British point of view of the American fleet burning on the shoreline in, in Ferris's Bay um, in this wonderful Ernie Haas painting, which we've seen several already. Uh, so returning to the Spitfire, uh, as I mentioned, the Spitfire sank on the night of the 11th, 12th, um, uh, during the escape from Valcour. Um, the vessel was relocated in 1997 during the Lake Champlain Cultural Resources Survey, which was a whole lake side scan sonar survey uh, of Lake Champlain that was completed by Lake Champlain Maritime Museum in conjunction with Middlebury College's geology department. And uh, in 1997, this very distinctive sonar image was picked up uh, in very deep water uh, in New York, New York waters on Lake Champlain. And it was pretty obviously a gunboat uh, from the moment it was seen. Um, the vessel was dived on to verify what it was uh, and its condition. And you can see the, the vessel is virtually intact. Um, the only thing missing from the, boat, the gunboat uh, that's, that's readily apparent is if there's only one gun left. The two, there would have, uh, in its original arrangement, there would have been a gun pointing out to either side of this vessel as well, and those are apparently missing, and presumably were dumped overboard in an effort to keep the boat afloat for as long as possible. Um, but other than that, the mast is still standing, which is quite remarkable, and the vessel is in uh, has been very well preserved by the cold, dark, fresh water of Lake Champlain. Um, in 2021 had the opportunity to uh, work with, through, through funding from Champlain Valley National Heritage Partnership. We again partnered with Middlebury College and their new research vessel, the David Folger, um, to go out and collect very high resolution multi view sonar data uh, of the Spitfire site. Um, 
this was a, a really amazing, th this vessel was absolutely mind boggling the technology on this boat. Um, and the way that Tom Manley and his crew, who is the professor from Middlebury College, uh, operated it was, was really amazing to see and to be a part of. Uh, here we can see some images from the survey uh, as we passed over the boat. Um, and these, I actually shot with my phone while we were doing the survey. This isn't post-processed data that's been all cleaned up and pretty. This is, this is what the images look like as they were coming up on the screen while the survey was at work. So very impressive. Now, we ended up having some difficulty with the multi-beam sonar. Didn't want to speak to the inertial navigation unit in the boat. So the, the actual sonar data of the, of the wreck site is not as high resolution as we had hoped. It still pro provides some valuable information. But the real um, interesting result of this uh, survey is the identification of a number of targets around the Spitfire site that are that we're going to explore this summer to determine if they might represent one of those guns that was dumped overboard from the uh, from the Spitfire or possibly another component of the <coughs> vessel that might have been dumped overboard. Um, so that was a, a you know turned out to be a, a, a really valuable piece of this survey, even though we didn't get precisely the multi-beam sonar data we wanted of the vessel itself. It was a choppy day, and this new sonar didn't talk to this inertial unit enough, so all the data has, has waves in it, which uh, isn't very, very helpful. Now, in 2022, we returned to the Spitfire site in an effort to create a three-dimensional model of the vessel. Um, and for this task, we were greatly aided by uh, Gary and Ellen Lefebvre and their vessel, the RV Amazon, uh, seen here on the lower right, which is... Gary named it the RV Amazon because he said that's where he bought most of the components for the boat. <laughs> uh, it's really an amazing little platform um, and perfect for the work that we, we wanted to do. We were also joined by um, this gentleman standing there holding our little ROV named Kotaro Yamafune, or we call him Koda, uh, a PhD student from Texas A&M University, or a PhD recipient from Texas A&M University who specializes in the creation of three-dimensional models of underwater shipwreck sites. Uh, and we also had his exquisite uh, pilot, um, Yasu, I'm gonna forget his last name now, Ikigawa, I believe his name was, uh, really just spectacularly talented ROV pilot and drone pilot for that matter. So we went out and utilizing uh, a, a low cost, um, what's now referred to as an underwater drone. You know, in the past, we've worked with much more expensive remote operated vehicles, and you may be familiar with them for, from things like uh, the Titanic or from the search for that sub that sank near the Titanic recently. You know, those were talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars of extremely high technology. Um, and you're talking about units that the Maritime Museum cannot afford to buy. <laughs> So we uh, were really excited. In, in the last five years, you've started to see the appearance of these underwater drones, which are, you could tell when the boat was holding it, it's quite small, uh, but incredibly maneuverable. Um, they have a long battery lifespan. They have uh, pretty decent lighting and decent cameras on board. They're extremely maneuverable and really easy to pilot, uh, even for somebody like me. Um, so we opted to go with this technology because Coda had spent a lot of time during the pandemic when he was, right, Coda spends most of his life traveling around to different archaeological sites doing photogrammetry models for them, but he was like the rest of us stuck at home for a couple of years, and he spent his time learning how to do photogrammetry using underwater drones. So he brought that capability and those skills to Lake Champlain to work with us on this project. Uh, they're, they're small, they're easy to fly, they're affordable, but you do have to attach some additional cameras to them. In this case, we use two uh, GoPro Hero 9s, uh, and we also attach some additional lighting systems in the form of between four and six dive lights that were uh, attached to the ROV on the outside, just to provide some additional illumination 
Um, since those cameras aren't oriented in the way that the headlights for this unit <coughs> would actually be beneficial. And these lights are much more powerful anyway. Um, to capture the images, a brief description of what photogrammetry is. You might have been saying this term. This is how we create the three-dimensional models. In order to create a photogrammetry model, you collect hundreds and in some cases thousands of images of a particular object from different angles, uh, ensuring that all those photos overlap a little bit. And when you load those into a computer program, it can identify the same point in multiple photos and stitch them together and determine the, the distance from the camera based on the pixel data. And therefore it can create these uh, into a three-dimensional model. It's quite remarkable and it's actually a lot of fun. To, <laughs> you know, I made a 3D model of my sleeping dog the other day, just for fun. <laughs> it's much easier to do above water than it is underwater, trust me. Um, so we spent uh, five days at the Spitfire site collecting uh, the multi, the, uh, the photogrammetry data that we needed. Uh, here's one of the few times that I was actually allowed to fly the ROV that's me sitting in the cabin looking with my hat on looking down while Gary looks uh, disapprovingly over my shoulder. <laughs> he was just making sure I was doing it right. Uh, but uh, we did we did have Yasu do most of the flying and um, you know, after day one, I flew for I flew the one mission on on day one, and Yasu flew the second mission that day. And the next morning, when I came in, I was like, oh, I'm ready to fly the ROV again. Kona was like, hey, Let's look at your data. <laughs> and he looked at my, he showed my data, and then he showed Yasu's data, and I was like, Why don't we have Yasu do it? <laughs> uh, he was just able to get much closer and much better overlap. I was pretty timid about making sure I wasn't going to get tangled into anything because this ROV does have an umbilical cord, right? This, this cable goes all the way down to the ROV when it's swimming around and there's always the potential for entanglement, um, which was not a concern with Yasu, <laughs> as it was with me anyway. Um, I have a short video clip here of the ROV actually doing some of the data collection. Uh, we, we did have a second ROV on the boat. Uh, this is actually one of Gary LeFay's ROVs filming the photo rig uh, down on the Spitfire site. You can see here it's above the, uh, the bow cannon uh, of the gunboat. We can see that it's very dark and very green and, uh, and pretty murky down there. But with those powerful lights, and uh, remarkably good cameras in, in the GoPro systems these days. Um, and we were able to set up those GoPros in a time-lapse setting. So it's actually taking a picture every half a second. It's not uh, doing video. It's taking still images, but it's taking them every half a second. So, yes. What's the depth of the water there? I, I'm not at liberty to discuss the depth oh, of the okay. <laughs> Um but deep, it's deep. Okay, it's deeper than I want to dive. Uh, so it's um, it's taking literally hundreds of pictures uh, over the course of those five days. We captured more than thirty thousand images of the Spitfire uh, using this technique, and you'll see it in the model. And maybe you saw it at the model at the beginning uh, of my slideshow. One of the things I was most impressed that Coda and Yasu were able to capture was the mast. Because one of the things that photogrammetry really has difficulty with is long, narrow objects that don't have structure around them that it can tie together, right? But Koda and Yasu developed a, a process where they uh, he did he did just dozens of little passes, you know, halfway around the the mast and then up and down the mast, and they went to the other side and did the same thing. Um, and was able to capture it in remarkable detail and with remarkable accuracy. Amazing. Doesn't look like much now. We're getting close to where the trestle tree is here, uh, which is which is a really interesting component. And demo, so you can see how it's at this weird angle. It's hanging down. You may have noticed in the drawing that I showed of the site at, uh, at the beginning, it wasn't angled like that. And uh, that's, that is a evidence of an impact or some kind of impact to the site that's happened since it was discovered in 1997. Murky. 
What, what kind of impact would have damaged We'll it? get to that in a second. So these are some of the stills of the 3D model that, that we were able to produce with all these images. Now, the computing power required to create this model was rather extensive as well. Um, the, the first step of the process is to align the images, right? So the, the computer looks through all of that data set, figures out which pictures are next to each other, figures out where the tie points are, and aligns all the photos. That took seven days of continuous computing, wow. right? You better hope you don't get an update. You better hope you don't get a power blip. You just got to let that thing run and chew away on this data for that long. Um, but in the end, uh, we were able to produce this, this rather fantastic <laughs> model. We have, uh, Coda is able to translate this data into these really cool black and white, almost looks like a pencil drawing images that you see here on the right. Uh, but now with this three-dimensional model, you know, we're able to spin it any way we want. You can look at it from the top, from the bottom, from the side. You can really zoom in and examine certain features of the boat. Uh, it's going to be remarkable for planning purposes, for, you know, whatever the future uh, of this boat is. Um, it's also a, a really powerful tool for monitoring the site and change over time. Since this is all, you know, it's all pixel data that, that's used to, that's combined to create this model. If we go back and create another three-dimensional model of this now, we could layer those two models on top of each other and it would highlight the areas that have changed. Mm -hmm. So if that trestle tree has sagged more or if there's more zebra mussels on the site, if there's, a, a, you know, if, if something else is dislodged, it will actually highlight those differences <laughs> between the two models. And that's, that's a pretty powerful tool um, to monitor the condition of this vessel over time, which is something that's extremely hard to do when a vessel's in this depth uh, and this hard to access. Chris, how deep is that settled in? It's, uh, you know, it's almost up to what I would guess is the water line of the vessel. So, well, and, and with these flat bottom boats, that's honestly not saying that much. So yeah, maybe yeah. two feet. Two feet. Yeah, 18 yeah. inches, two feet, I would guess. What, what's the box-like structure just um, ahead of the fort? On that four deck? Here? Yeah. So this gun is actually mounted on a slide system. Okay. It's not on a wheeled carriage. The two waste guns would have been mounted on wheeled, a traditional wheeled naval carriage. This is on a slide. So when this gun fired, it would recoil. It would slide along those tracks oh, and stop there. Wow. It would reload it and then run it forward nice. again. Nice. And actually right here in the very back of that little box is actually a little, a little dead eye a little, uh, or a little sh uh, shiv of some sort, a pulley to help them uh, when they needed to maneuver that around. And there are two vertical posts at the stern um, at a, where the tiller would come in. Well, so I assume that's all part of this railing, right, which you can see here. It would have extended around the back. There was also probably an, uh, an awning support structure over the back of that vessel. Um, from where they had suspended during the during the battle, they had suspended uh, fascines, which are, you know bundled saplings, yeah. uh, kind of like old old tiny sandbags, I guess you'd say, uh, something that could deflect or small uh, deflect or stop small shot from coming in. And those would have been also hung from that awning support network. Remarkable model. I was absolutely impressed with the results we were able to achieve here. Uh, one thing you will notice is all of this, these gray blobs all over inside the boat, outside the boat. This is actually aquatic plant material that has drifted out of a shallow bay somewhere nearby, probably rolled across the bottom of the lake after a storm and has snagged itself on the boat and settled around it. And the boat sits in water deep enough that it's beyond the, perf the preference for zebra mussels. Right? They typically live down to about 80 or 90 feet, and you start to see less and less of them as you dive. So you would normally see uh, zebra mussels on a wreck this deep. But um, my hypothesis is that there are a few dozen zebra mussels on the Spitfire, mostly in this bow cannon area. And they were probably carried there in this weed mass as it drifted down from shallower water. Those mussels have relocated themselves as that 
weed mass deteriorated onto the vessel and they're staying there. They don't seem to be, uh, their population doesn't seem to be expanding in the way it does in shallower water, uh, but there are some zebra mussels present on, uh, on the Spitfire. Uh, so here we can talk about this potential damage to the uh, to the trestle, uh, to the trees at the top. Um, most likely, it was impacted by a downrigger ball. Yeah, this, this whole area is a pretty active fishing area. If you're not familiar with it, what a downrigger is, it's a it's a piece of fishing equipment that consists of um, you know a braided metal cable that uh, has a uh, they, they literally call it a cannonball, uh, a, a lead weight, five or 10 pound lead weight that um, is attached to the end of that, uh, that steel cable. And it has a little tag off the end of it that you would attach your actual fishing line to. And what that does is it carries your bait down deep and it keeps it there. Because um, normally, if and then you control along, uh, you know, you can drive your boat forward and it keeps your bait at the depth you want. Um, and then when a, a fish comes and bites your lure, this actually releases, and then you fight the fish normally as you would with the fishing rod. But as you troll along, this cannonball and steel cable arrangement has the potential to snag onto things. And our hypothesis is that's what's happened to the to the top uh, here on the on the Spitfire. Um, it's just seems to have probably snagged on. I mean this. This is a, a crosshatch arrangement of timbers here. That's a pretty easy thing to get snagged on. I would also guess that that's what's happened in the bow. If we go back, wouldn't surprise me if that's why this rail has popped up like this as well. That's quite possibly from another impact uh, of a similar nature. So what's uh, what's next for uh, for the Spitfire? Uh, in addition to the support that we've received from the Champlain Valley National Heritage Partnership and from the Lake Champlain Basin Program, we've recently been awarded a, um, a grant from the American Battlefield Protection Program, which is a national park service uh, granting agency, to uh, help design the next phase of research around the Spitfire. A uh, big part of that is, is uh, the assembly of an advisory council of local cultural organizations and institutions, as well as other technical experts um, and archaeologists to help us create the research design for what's going to happen next. Um, you know, re development of a research design is an integral part of any archaeological project. That's when you identify what your research questions are and you identify your methodology for answering those questions. So that's going to be a, a big part of the next phase of this work is just deciding what's going to happen and how it's going to happen. That's going to involve public input. And of course, it's going to involve our partners at Navy History and Heritage Command, who are the folks that technically, not technically, that do still have management authority over this vessel. Right? Any sunken military vessel remains the property of the government whose flag it was flying at the time it sank. And in this case, that includes the Spitfire. So it still belongs to the US Navy. They have the management authority over it. Everything we do is recommendations to them that can't be implemented until we have their approval and their permits to do so. And it's a pretty lengthy permitting process. <laughs> Um, and we want to continue to design and plan what kind of infrastructure we need to have around the site if we're going to conduct uh, any future archaeological examinations. That's my Spitfire talk. And now I'm going to move on to talking about the work we've been doing in Arnold's Bay, which was previously known as Ferris's Bay. Be happy to answer more questions about uh, Spitfire and that whole project as we get to the end here. But let's you see how I'm doing on time? Okay. Uh, we'll keep going here through Arnold's Bay. Um, also in 2021, we received another American Battlefield Protection Program grant to uh, examine the battlefield at Arnold's Bay. Um, this is the location that Arnold drove those five remaining vessels uh, into what was then known as Arnold's, uh, Ferris's Bay, drove them up onto the shoreline, and burned the fleet before escaping overland. 
can't really tell from this picture, but we're actually standing up on a bluff that's about 25 feet higher than the, than the shoreline you see down here. And that's the bluff that those four guys had to escape up uh, as they, they fled from the vessels uh, that were burning down below. And while the British were out there at the mouth of the, of the bay firing at them. Um, Arnold's Bay is a relatively small harbor. It's at the very southern end of Button Bay. It's about 300 yards across. It's 300 yards from the mouth to the shoreline. And even at the mouth of the bay, it's only 15 feet deep. And it gets shallower very rapidly as you move into it. So it's a, it's a quiet little, uh, little harbor. There is now a public boat launch on the northern point uh, of it. This is the Virgin's water intake plant. That's where I get my drinking water. I live in Virgin. Um, which uh, has a pipeline that runs way out into the lake uh, to, to collect drinking water. Um, the ships that were burned and sunk in Arnold's Bay never really, were, so it was known as Ferris's Bay because uh, there was a homesteading family that lived on the bay there, the Ferris family, um, and they were very well known um, for travelers through the area. Benedict Arnold certainly knew of the Ferris's. Uh, if he hadn't personally visited them himself. Um, he was, I think, pretty familiar with the shallow bay, and that's why he chose to, to take his fleet in there. Um, the Ferris's were sympathetic to the rebel cause, so that's also a, a, an advantage for escaping into their harbor. But pretty quickly after the events of October 13th, the place started to be called Arnold's Bay, and that's, of course, what we know, uh, know it as today. Um, but those wrecks never really went out of consciousness. You know, the British returned a couple of days after the burning event to, uh, to, to recover cannon and what other equipment they could find from the hulks uh, to incorporate into their own fleet and their own forces. Uh, they did also find a number of bodies floating in the lake and on the shore, and they recovered those and buried them um, uh, on the shore. Uh, but even after the British left, these vessels were certainly still visible in low water events. Uh, and for the locals here, they certainly knew those vessels were there all along. And they continued to interact with these vessels throughout the 19th century. Um, we have reports of three of the gunboats being pulled out during the 19th century or picked apart. Um, <coughs> we don't really know much more about them in detail. Um, in 1892, the gentleman that ran the ferry um, from uh, Arnold's Bay over to Westport, New York, um, uh, Captain Adams, he decided he wanted to recover a part of the Congress, which I'm sure he saw every day as he was bringing his boat in and out of this harbor. And so they latched onto this boat. I don't really know how. That's something I would really like to know. But they managed to pull this nearly 30 foot long section of the stern of the boat break it off of the rest of the wreck and drag it up on the shore. Um, he, it was displayed here for uh, a, a short period before it was sold to the Barnes family who operated the tavern at Chimney Point, which is where the Chimney Point historical site is now today. Um, and they displayed this wreckage from the Congress uh, behind the tavern. And um, it was recently given an article from a newspaper from 1930 uh, from uh, Elser Gilbertson, who is the, the coordinator for the Chimney Point Historical Site. She had stumbled across this article that mentioned in 1930, somebody commenting on the pile of rotten wood in the backyard that was part of Arnold's flagship uh, at the Battle of Alcor Island. So some of it existed into the 20th century, but it, it's, it's gone now. Uh, we are lucky enough to have two of the floors um, you know, those V-shaped timbers that you saw in that black and white photograph were recovered uh, and are now on display at the, at the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. Interesting pieces of wood here. You can see particularly that one on the left. That's a terrible piece of wood to build a ship out of. <laughs> I think demonstrates that uh, the shipbuilders in 1776 were using whatever they could find. We have reports that they would often have to travel up to 12 miles just to find white oak curves that would be useful to them. So, you know, the amount of work that went into building these vessels, which only lasted a few weeks or a few months, uh, is quite remarkable. 
But we're really lucky to have these two uh, remaining pieces of the stern because everything else is gone. Um, in 1961 and 1962, um, the Lake Champlain Archaeological Association, a, a small group of individuals uh, led by uh, Bill Leach, ran, led an excavation of, well, they, they spent the, the first year relocating the site of the Congress, and they did an uh, what they call an avocational archaeological uh, excavation of the site in 1962. And they recovered uh, several hundred artifacts from the remains of the forward part of the Congress, the part that didn't get pulled out of the water. And they found, uh, they found a remarkable uh, number of really fantastic artifacts. Um, we have uh, an ads, which obviously would have been very important for constructing the boat. Um, we have a cold chisel, some big iron rods, some pieces of armament here, that's part of a musket trigger guard, a couple of um, bayonet scabbard belt hooks, all kinds of really amazing stuff, great glassware. Um, luckily, this collection um, was donated by Bill Leach to the Maritime Museum uh, in the late 90s. This is actually one of the first collections of artifacts I worked on when I was uh, an intern at the Maritime Museum 25 years ago. Um, and so it's been great to come back to this project and have this uh, collection uh, to go along with it. Um, in 2001, the Maritime Museum conducted a, a survey of uh, Arnold's Bay and did relocate the Congress. You can see it right there, right? There it is, sticking out of the water. Just one plank sticking out of the water, but around that plank are a couple more little frame tips, you know, just the ends of timber sticking up out of the mud enough to identify that that's where the Congress is located. Uh, when we returned in 2021, we relocated that same plank. That's the same one there. I, I did a little, a little bit of hand fanning to uncover a couple more timbers here. But you can see there's hall planks, there's frames, and there's ceiling planks, which is the internal planking uh, of this vessel still present. We also conducted an extensive amount of metal detecting survey around the Congress site. Um, for a number of reasons. Uh, the, the, the bottom lands of Arnold's Bay are state land. So we had a Vermont state archeological <laughs> permit to examine that portion of the site, but we had to have a permit from the US Navy to look at the actual Congress remains. Uh, and throughout 2022, we were still waiting for that permit to come. Um, you can see though, we found a tremendous amount of material around uh, the Congress. Uh, this is about 800 artifacts now. Each of those different colors of pins indicates a different type of material. Um, all the green ones are musket balls, all the pink ones are nails, the red ones I think are iron shot like cannonballs and, and uh, canister shot. Um, just an incredible density of artifacts. We had really been hoping that we would find kind of distinct clusters of artifacts. Like here's where a gunboat was burned and sank. Here's where another gunboat was burned and sank. Here's where the Congress was. But instead we just found artifacts everywhere. So hard to be upset about that, but it has raised more questions than it's answered uh, to some extent. So we found cannonballs, uh, this, uh, inkwell, uh, spoon handle, Peter spoon handle that has the initials AP carved into it, which is uh, just remarkable. Um, a number of bayonets and bayonet fragments uh, came out of the site as well. Uh, at the end of 2022, our uh, Navy permit finally arrived, and we were able to spend just one week doing excavations uh, of the Congress remains itself. We used two uh, water induction dredges, and this is what we expected to find, right? We, we, we could see these little frame tips sticking out of the mud. We assumed we'd dig down along the frame, we'd come across the center line of the vessel and the keelson, and then we'd go up the other side. That's not what we found when we dug it though. There is no center line to this. Uh, it was very perplexing until we really dug down here on the left side and we realized that's the keel. That's the center of the vessel. What we have is the boats broken at the center and fallen out like this. So this is a, a large chunk of the starboard side. But that's all we were able to accomplish uh, in 2022. Though we did get some evidence that there might be something off to the port side there as well. Uh, the plan for 2023 was to excavate along the keel. And then when the keel stopped, we were going to do a trench at either end. 
uh, expand the trench in the middle. You know, all. Um, do you guys remember last summer? Yeah. <laughs> it rained like every freaking day. Yeah, that made life very difficult. Um, we were able to assemble this very ragamuffin crew of archaeologists. I promise this is actually the best picture that I could get. This. Um, we spent three weeks at Arnold's Bay uh, last summer working again with two induction dredges. Um, we have our my colleague Cher here sifting through the spoil that comes out of the dredge and looking for artifacts. She's having a great time. Again, we found musket balls, buttons, and even a leather shoe. And probably the artifact I was most excited about is this tiny little glass bead that is probably the insert for a cuff button. It's clear glass. If you look closely, it actually has a ship embossed oh, wow. in the surface of the glass. Really cool, tiny little thing. And for once, I got to find a cool thing. <laughs> so I was pretty excited about that. Um, and this is what we were able to uncover as far as the, the remains of the vessel. We didn't get as far as we had hoped because the conditions were atrocious. Um, we never saw this underwater. What you saw underwater was, you know, a little bit of it. But we were able to create this photogrammetry model that captured the whole site. Uh, so this, again, is the keel which as it goes forward is cut down probably to where the stem of the vessel was. It seems to be broken off here, so there's framing continued to the stern. And now I know I'm out of time, but real quickly, let me just tell you some of the really interesting features that we uncovered here. Uh, the keel is very well preserved. We were able to get its uh, dimensions very, very accurately. The framing is interesting because you can see none of those frames are actually next to each other. The way you normally assemble a ship is you have the floor that goes across the keel, and then you have the futtocks are attached you know, to the sides and they form a complete frame. This has an open framing pattern where they, none of the, the futtocks are actually attached to the floors. Um, and I shouldn't say none, there are probably some, like every fourth or fifth frame must be a made frame. Um, but we failed to uncover one of those. The other, uh, there's a combination of iron fastening and wooden uh, trunnel fastening on this boat, which is very typical of 18th century uh, Revolutionary War vessels. <coughs> um, I would ask you to notice the, the variability in the dimensions of these timbers. <laughs> They're all about eight inches tall or uh, in their uh, molded dimension, but like, look at that thing. Look at that. It's, you know, it's like a foot wide. You, know, you got ones like this that are maybe six and a half, seven inches wide. So, again, an example of whatever wood you got, you bring it, we're going to shape it, we're going to fit it in there somehow. We just got to get this boat to the fleet quick. Um, we have well preserved ceiling planking. Um, you know, we, while we did find those few small artifacts, we didn't find many large artifacts because they had all been recovered by Bill Leach and company uh, in the 1960s. And that, that's kind of what we expected. But down here in the deep part around the keel, that's where we find musket balls and buttons and little things that had been missed in the 1960s, when apparently the visibility was even worse <laughs> than it was last summer. Um, and so this is the portion of the vessel that I believe we've examined or have been examining. is a good sized portion of the stern side of the vessel. <clears throat> the remains uh, here are, it's about 28 feet in length this way and 13 feet across. It is just the starboard side of the vessel. Um, but there is quite the possibility that the port side is here. When the excavations were done here in the 1960s, um, they removed the ballast stones that were still on the wreck and they just took them to what they thought was outside the wreck and they put them over here. <laughs> so now there's this huge pile of stones over here right, that I think could be sitting on top of at least some kind of remains from the port side of the vessel that I hope to examine in the future. That'll have to wait for another grant and some additional <laughs> boundaries and, and hopefully less rain. So that, you know, thank you to all our many sponsors, including uh, Champlain Valley National Heritage Partnership, American Battlefield Protection Program, Vermont Division for Historic Preservation, New York State Department of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation, Navy History and Heritage Command, 
whole part of this project that I didn't even get to is that we did terrestrial uh, metal detecting on the shoreline and in the farm fields around the bay as well. But for that, we had some uh, collaboration with the Tribal Historic Preservation Offices in the area and lots of great donors, volunteers, and interns uh, during our project. Thanks. That's what we've got going on. <laughs> 45 minutes seemed like enough. I know. Yeah, well, first. We had a little glitch up there on the front end, so yeah. sorry about that. So, does that, um, can you hang in there for a couple of questions? Sure. And if you need to leave, go ahead, but let's try questions. Come sure. On. Yes. Where did the shipwrights come from? How many were there, and how long did it take to build this week? Yeah, they, um, Shipwrights came from all over the place, to be honest with you. And they were actually having a really hard time recruiting uh, shipwrights who were making really good money on the East Coast, building privateers and, and vessels like that, to come to this absolute backwater place to build, you know, uh, vessels for the rebel fleet. So apparently they had to uh, encourage them with by paying them an absolute premium. In some cases, the shipwrights were making more than the generals that they were working for because they were just that desperate to get people there uh, to start working. As to the speed of the build, um, speaking of the Congress specifically, uh, it was laid down at the end of July. It was launched at the end of, uh, of August, mid-September, and then it traveled up to Fort Ticonderoga where it was rigged and armed. And it joined, it joined the fleet at Valcor just a few days before the battle. So, you know, literally this boat was only a couple weeks old when it was burned and abandoned. Mm -hmm. um, so they were working frantically to build this fleet uh, as quickly as possible. Yes? So you said that the waterway from the Richelieu River down to New York City was really important even as early as the 1700s. But before the Champlain Canal, how did they get from Lake Champlain to the Hudson River? Well, there, there was an overland stretch there that you had to portage your stuff uh, across. And that's obviously the reason that the Champlain Canal was ultimately built was to uh, avoid that. And that's when the huge commercial boom happened on Lake Champlain. When, when you could take a load of cargo from Burlington or Plattsburgh all the way to New York City and back without having to transload it onto a wagon and then onto another boat, that greatly reduced the cost of shipping uh, and the time required. Uh, but at this point, they would have had to portage it down to probably near Fort Edward, New York, at the headwaters of the Hudson, where they would load it back into boats and take it down. So did they portage really, uh, so that really limited the size of the boat that got Move. Yeah, they, they wouldn't actually move boats from one body of water to the other. They would load it onto wagons or whatever. And they, they did incorporate Lake George into that as well. So you'd get as you know to the southern end of Lake George, even a little bit closer to the headwaters of the Hudson than Skeensboro or Whitehall uh, is at this point. Yes. And when you describe the battle, you never mentioned uh, Collins Prize. <laughs> it is a topical story. It's a story that has uh, many intricacies that, you know, there's a lot of questions still about Carlton's Prize. Even what exactly is Carlton's Prize? Which little island is it? Uh, is still a bit of a, of a confusion. This is, uh, there's a small speck of land in the middle, <laughs> in the middle of the lake that um, one of the British commanders apparently saw in the mist and fog of the morning and fired upon only to real thinking it was a, a rebel ship and, and you know come to find out it's just a small little island that he had mistaken for a vessel um but there's there's still some questions about that whole story and and its location <laughs> there are cannonballs down there right some yeah. people have said they found yeah, cannonballs and, family. really yeah. yeah one more yeah well <laughs> Do we have any online ones that we need to? Good learn? question. Do we have any online ones, right? Okay. Great. All right. Well, I'm happy to chat with anybody afterwards, too, as we break up. Uh, thank you very much. Chris. Good night. Thank you, Chris.